I don't know whether or not I should be offended, but when Pastor Matt started the service today, he did not introduce me. So if you don't know who I am, I'm going to have to introduce myself. My name is Aaron Taylor. Um, You can probably tell by my accent or lack thereof, I'm not from here. I'm from the great state of Ohio. Go Buckeyes. No? Okay. Probably a bad way to start this message, I guess. But no, my name is Aaron. I am a church planter in Columbus, Ohio, and I also serve as the teaching pastor of a church called Living Hope Church, Living Hope Columbus, as we call it. And it is a new church. Uh, We're five years old. It's a church plant that at Indian Springs, the last few years, you have graciously and generously supported our church through prayer, through giving, and also through the sending of mission teams as well. Um, So I I bring you greetings from Living Hope this morning. Our church knows that I'm here um, bringing the Word of God to you all this morning. I knew that I I flew down to Arkansas to be with you guys today. Um, My goal this morning, we're going to look at the Scriptures here in just a moment, but as we work our way through the Scriptures today, um, I want to give you some updates about Living Hope and why your generosity and your prayers and your partnership matter to church planting in Columbus, Ohio. Um, Just to give you some perspective on this, as we worship in this room this morning, as we're gathered here today, literally right in this moment, right now, there's a congregation in Northwest Columbus, Ohio, in a small community known as Powell, who are also gathered for worship. And that happens, and that's in part because of your generosity and your prayers. It's funny to me, I was sharing with your pastor this morning, I had the opportunity to be here at Indian Springs a couple years ago, and I was able to share at your uh, student winter retreat and share with you on a Sunday morning. What's so interesting is how the dynamic of living hope has drastically changed in the last uh, two years. Two years ago when I was with you, our congregation was just a, a bunch of Americans gathering for worship. But nine months ago, God did something miraculous, unexpected, but now we can't imagine living hope any different where God literally brought the nations to our doorstep at Living Hope Columbus. So this morning, as we gather here for worship, if this doesn't blow your mind, something's wrong with you because this blows my mind every time that I share this. At Living Hope Columbus, in Columbus, Ohio, of all places, at Living Hope this morning will be people gathered for worship from six different nations and will also worship together at Living Hope this morning in two languages, in English and in Spanish. It blows my mind that in Powell, Ohio, right now, there's a church that's worshiping that I get to pastor, which is just by the grace of God, who this morning, they will worship in English like we did today, and they'll also worship in Spanish. 30% of my church right now is non-English speaking, not from this country. They're from Central America and have relocated to Columbus, Ohio from all over the place. When I preach on Sunday mornings, um, you're going to learn here in a second, I'm, I'm not the greatest preacher in the world, but for some reason, people keep showing up, and I don't know quite why. But when I preach, I preach in English, and it's live translated on a 70-inch TV next to me in Spanish, because there's people in my church that don't speak English, but through the, the use of technology, they're able to know in their heart language the gospel, and they're able to taught the Word of God um, in their own language. It's, it's wild. And I love Indian Springs, and your pastor's been sharing with me over these past few months God's activity here, which is just amazing. But man, I'm telling you, the Lord is moving in a very special way here in Arkansas, in Ohio, and I hope you've seen recently, literally all across our country. And I want to tell you this, um, because of your generosity and your prayers, I hope you know that you've played a part in our story. And I'm not making this up. When I tell our church often, so as a church plant, we've, over the last several years, we've been dependent upon churches like Indian Springs to help us get off the ground. And one of the phrases we remind our people of often is that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm sure you've heard that before. Meaning that as a young church, we get to do what we do for the kingdom of God because we're standing on the shoulders of faithful believers like this church, established churches like Indian Springs. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your generosity, for your prayers. Thank you for paving the way in believing in church planting in North America, for believing in a a goofball like me that that God could maybe use to reach people in Columbus, Ohio. I thank you from Living Hope. Now let's talk about Jesus. If you've got a copy of the scriptures, turn with me to Psalm chapter 41. 
Psalm chapter 41, the middle of your Bible, Psalm 41. And we do me a favor. Again, I'm not from here. Um, and so one thing we like to do at Living Hope, and I hope this is okay, if you're willing and able, as we read the scriptures, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? We say two things at Living Hope when we, we do this. I don't know if you do this at Indian Springs or not. Um, we say that when we stand, we get to honor the scriptures because they're a big deal that God wrote a book and that we can know him through his word. But also when we stand for the reading of the scriptures, we're choosing now to place ourselves under the authority of God's word and symbolically saying, Lord, whatever you say today, I submit myself to because you're Lord of my life. Psalm 41, we're going to read the first three verses. God's word says this, happy is the one who is considerate of the poor. The Lord will save him in a day of adversity. The Lord will keep him and preserve him and he will be blessed in the land. You will not give him over to the desires of his enemies. The Lord will sustain him on his sickbed. You will heal him on the bed where he lies. Can we pray together? Father, we love you, Jesus. Thank you so much for the scriptures. God, we pray this morning as we walk through this text together that your spirit would be among us, teaching us and molding us into the image of Jesus today. God, we pray for open ears to hear from you, Lord, but we don't just wanna hear your word, we want it to change us, so we pray for soft hearts. And even beyond that, Father, we pray, as James talks about, for willing and obedient hands and feet because God, we don't want to just simply be hearers of the word, we want to be doers of the word. And so God, would your spirit move among us today and do something special, significant, and eternal in our lives this morning. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. You may be seated. One of the phrases that we've used a lot this last year at Living Hope Columbus is this, it's that God can do a lot with a dot. What does that mean when we say that God can do a lot with a dot? We talk about our church, that we're, we're simply a small dot on the map, but Jesus is choosing to do some pretty amazing things through the people of his church. To give you a little background, if you don't remember our story so that you know what you're partnering with in Columbus, Ohio, when we started Living Hope five years ago, we set out to fulfill a singular mission. So our mission sta statement to this day, to help people find and follow Jesus. Did y'all know that Jesus is the hope of the world? That without Jesus, we're hopeless. And that the mission of the local church is to take the name of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus to every corner of this world, every dark crevice we can find and bring the hope of the gospel. That's why we start churches. And when we started Living Hope, that was the mission, helping people find and follow Jesus. And in those early days of starting Living Hope back in 2018, we were literally trying everything to do that, help people find and follow Jesus. If you didn't know this, here's the secret sauce of church planting. If God ever calls you to plant a church or help with a church plant, here's the secret to church planting. I've, I've learned this over the past five years. You try everything, you fall a lot, you wipe off your knees, and you try again. And I feel like so much of our story was that. In the early days of Living Hope, we approached countless organizations with this simple question, how can we help? And because we wanted to be, just as you do, we wanted to be a church in our city that the city was thankful that was there. We see that modeled in Jeremiah 17 verse nine where God tells the Israelites to seek the welfare of the city in which God had placed them. We desired to be that in Powell, Ohio. So early in the process, we sat down with a local nonprofit in Dublin, Ohio, Northwest Columbus, known as One Dublin. We asked them how we could help, and we found out that they were regularly delivering mattresses to people all across Northwest Columbus, people that didn't have furniture, people that had moved here from various countries to our side of the city. It was interesting at that time, they were delivering mattresses in the back of minivans. I can tell you from experience helping them, it's pretty hard to put a King mattress in the back of a Dodge Caravan. I'm just gonna tell you, that's not really easy. So it wasn't the most efficient process, making several trips all over the place, helping countless people. But Jesus had been so kind to our young church that a few months before, someone had given us a 14 foot box truck. And so we took that box truck a couple times a month. We offered assistance delivering those beds. We would load it up and we would go and we would deliver furniture to people all across 
our community. I'll never forget this one encounter. This is why I share this story this morning. It was an encounter that changed my heart personally. It changed me as a pastor and a follower of Jesus. And it's literally made it my life's mission, I believe, to mobilize the church to help people. The DNA of Living Hope was birthed from this moment. We pulled up to an apartment complex. We knocked on the door. We were met by a very large family from the Middle East. I can't recall what country they were from. They'd only lived in our area of the city for just a few months, and we walked back to our truck. They had some twin mattresses that we were supposed to bring them. We gathered those twin mattresses up, threw them under our arms. We carried them up to the door, and we were met at that front door by two little boys. They couldn't have been more than five or six years old. And I'll never forget the moment with that mattress under my arm that I walked through the threshold of that two-bedroom apartment in Dublin, Ohio. And one of those little boys from the Middle East threw his hand straight up in the air, and he shouted these words, and they haunt me to this day. He said, I finally have a bed to sleep on tonight. Five years old three miles from my church. How could we let that happen? How could we let a toddler not have a bed to sleep on? And that changes you. And I knew in that moment that the Lord had called our church to do something very unique in the way that we help people. That God had a special mission for Living Hope Columbus because there was a need ever present just a few miles from our church. And let me share with you this morning, I feel like this is my life's message as we get into Psalm 41. I hope this encourages you today and I hope this motivates you. I've learned this over the last few years that the gospel travels fastest on the backs of helping people. The gospel travels fastest on the back of helping people. That as followers of Jesus, as the Lord encourages us in the gospels, that we are to be salt in light in a decaying and dark world. That we help people, but as Jesus followers, we don't just help people, we help people under the banner and the mantra with the message of the gospel. That we use helping people as the avenue in which we have the opportunity to share the hope of Jesus Christ. It's what God has called us to do. It's who he's called us to be. And I want to show us three truths today from Psalm 41, link these to the New Testament, and share, again, some personal stories to update you as to what God is doing in our church. A little bit of context here in Psalm 41, if you're a note taker, if this is of interest to you. Psalm 41 ends the first of five books that make up the book of Psalms. This portion of Psalms, Psalm 41 is the end, and there's four other ones. All 41 of the first books here are attributed to King David. What I love about this psalm is the first three verses are incredibly celebratory in nature. As David talks about this idea of helping people, it's a posture and a tone of celebration that David takes. I want to give us three takeaways points here, but let's begin by starting at verse one. Out of the gate, in my Bible translation, the CSB, David starts with the word happy. If you have a hard copy of the scriptures, I would circle, underline, or highlight that word happy. Your Bible might say blessed. I think that's a better translation of that word there. It's a word that means in the Hebrew, someone that has gained divine favor, that their actions in some capacity have produced God's blessing in their life. And David says there in Psalm 41, 1, that if I want to be blessed by God, what's my necessary response? He says, happy or blessed is the one who is considerate of the poor. It's when you and I choose to take the attention off of ourselves, the focus off of ourselves, operate under the umbrella of Philippians 2 and this posture of humility, and we start to think more about the needs of other people. Here's an interesting thing for us from Psalm 41.1. The blessing of God follows helping people. David's very clear about that. That our God, the heart of our God, that he looks favorably when his people are considerate of those who are in need. That word poor, that's another word I'd underline and mark a couple notes by. Under the Old Testament Jewish law, that didn't just mean people who were were financially struggling. That was a word that encompassed not only the poor, but it's a word that encompassed the orphan, those who were physically ill, those who were sick, the widows, and also the immigrant. It was a word that was meant to sum up basically anyone who was in need. 
And the idea communicated there in verse one is that no matter the person as a child of God, that you and I out of the overflow of our relationship with God are called to care about people. They were called to help people. That's what the church is supposed to do. So three takeaways from this passage of scripture this morning, if you're a note taker, the first one is this, as a follower of Jesus, let me encourage you from this scripture passage to don't forget to see people. Don't forget to see people. Notice what David said in verse one of Psalm 41, one. He said, happy is the one who is considerate of the poor. That's an important word there, the word considerate. I don't want us to miss this. God showed this to me last year and that's just such a good reminder. You know, there's a difference between considering something and glancing at something. Do you know there's a difference between considering something and glancing at something? Because we glance at things all the time. When you glance at something, you don't have to see it. It just passes over your eyesight. Ladies, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You send your husband to the pantry or the refrigerator to get the bottle of ketchup. He opens the door, he looks in there, it's not there. (laughs) And what do you do? You walk over and you find it immediately. Why? Because as men, we're really good at glancing at things, but we're not very good at considering things. When you glance at something, it crosses your eyes, but it never makes its way to your heart. When you consider something, you have to pay attention to it and it could possibly change you. God has wired me in such a way, I'm a type A list driven kind of guy. And I miss opportunities all the time around me because I'm so busy glancing and moving that I never stop to consider. I never stop to actually see people. I'm reminded of the story in Acts chapter three. If you wanna flip over there quickly, you're welcome to. In Acts chapter three, Peter and John are heading to the temple at three in the afternoon for a time of prayer. And the Bible says in Acts three that they're met there by a man who had been paralyzed or crippled from birth. And the Bible shows us there in Acts 3 that this man had been laid for years there at the temple gate so that he could beg for money. He had no other option. He could beg for money from people who are entering the temple to worship. I hope I'm not taking too much liberty here, but I'd have to imagine if that same man was in the same spot for a number of years, that he had probably become white noise to the people who were daily coming to worship. They had simply gotten used to, that's where that guy is, that's what that guy does. Every day, same thing, crying out the same thing. They heard the same thing. And when they walked by, what did they do? They glanced, but they didn't consider. As Peter and John, the Bible says in verse four of Acts three, were entering the temple. The Bible says he asked those two guys for money. And look at Acts chapter three, verse four. One of my favorite verses in the book of Acts. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, listen to this, look at us. Look at us. Imagine this moment for this paralyzed man who had been stuck there at the temple gate for so many years. I wonder, some questions to consider, when was the last time someone had actually looked at him? When was the last time someone actually engaged him? When was the last time that a worshiper who was heading to worship God paused their own agenda to actually stop and consider someone who was in need on their way to worship? When was the last time that actually happened? And the Bible teaches in Acts chapter three that because Peter and John were willing to press pause, they entered into his world, this man's life was changed. Not only was he healed, but the Bible says that he met Jesus God's been teaching me over and over the last couple of years that if I wanna make a difference in this world in the name of Jesus Christ, that I have to start laying aside my own personal agenda and consider those in need around me. If you're aware of our story, this won't be new to you. If you're not and haven't been at Indian Springs long, um, let me give you a couple of cliff notes. A couple of years ago, our church by faith, and actually I say by faith, I actually mean like a little bit of insanity at the same time because this was not a very responsible financial decisions. But we opened up a free furniture store next door to our church called the Finding Hope Center. And we did it on a huge, huge leap of faith. And by God's grace, he has honored it where we now partner with over a dozen non and for profits to provide furniture to immigrants, refugees, single moms, and victims of domestic abuse all across Northwest Columbus. And we do it for 100% free. We don't charge anything for the furniture that we give away. Last year alone, my church, uh, this is by God's grace, my church has 120 people in it. Last year, by God's grace, through our furniture store, we helped over 80 families and we gave away for free 
um, to these families. A dozen different nations represented all across the Middle East, Russia, Ukraine, Central America, um, some Asian families, literally all over the world that came through. Multiple faith backgrounds, not only Christian, but you had Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, everybody came through. Last year, our church of 120 people gave away $400,000 worth of furniture, and it didn't cost us anything, and we didn't charge anything for it, by God's grace. And when we do it, (laughs) every person that comes through hears about Jesus. That's why we do what we do. And one of my favorite things was about a year ago, we were doing some deliveries from our furniture store. So families come in for an appointment. They get to pick out their furniture in a safe, comfortable environment. We're able to pray with them, share the gospel with them. And then within a week, we deliver the furniture to their home. So we get to be in their living rooms and converse and have conversations with people from all over the world. About a year ago, we were at our last stop of the night. We were tired. We had done all kinds of deliveries. The previous delivery, no joke, we delivered um, couches, recliners, mattresses, and tables up three flights of stairs into a two-bedroom apartment. Here's the reality. I don't care how fit you are. You carry a couch and a king mattress up three flights of of stairs. You can do all the CrossFit you want. You're still going to be tired, right? It was terrible. It was the worst. We got to that last house. We were tired. It was like, man, we just want to drop this stuff. I want to go home, and I want to eat a Big Mac kind of a thing. Like, I just needed calories. I was done. We went in drop this furniture to the family. They were from Afghanistan and they wanted us to stay. And I was reminded, this was around the time where God was really wrestling with me from Psalm 41, or I wanted to go. And you can kind of hear the spirit of God using the word of God in the back of your brain going, be considerate of those in need, be considerate of those in need, be considerate of those in need. And so we paused and we, we, we just spent time with them. We sat down on their couch and they brought down, out tea And they brought out snacks from Afghanistan. Why? Because they wanted to simply pause and talk. I can't imagine being forced out of my home country to a strange land where I knew nobody. They needed friends, we found out. We spent the next probably hour and a half, two hours in the living room of this Muslim family from Afghanistan. We talked about all kinds of things, cultural differences. We talked about faith and our belief in Jesus and what the gospel was. We talked about Domino's Pizza. I learned that this gentleman in the few weeks he'd been in in Ohio had discovered Domino's and it changed his life. (laughs) He's like, I've never had this before and it's so amazing. I mean, it was just awesome. A couple hours later, we, we left their home. But you see, that matters to people. When followers of Jesus are willing to step into their world, look into their eyes, listen to their words, hear about their needs and simply be present, And God continues to remind me from Psalm 41 that as a follower of Christ, I need to make it a habit like they did in Acts 3, to walk slow, listen deeply, and stop rushing. Be present for people. Don't forget to see people. Point number two, don't forget to love people. This isn't complicated stuff this morning. Psalm 41, 1 is really a kind of equivalent of Matthew 22, the great commandment. Psalm 41, 1, the evidence of God's blessing is my life is consideration of the poor. As I'm considerate of the poor, I'm showing that I I love the Lord. Matthew 22, what what does Jesus tell us? The evidence of my love for God is my love for people. You guys remember what happened when the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus with the question of what is the greatest commandment of the law? They were trying to get him to undervalue a portion of the law and thereby commit blasphemy against God. And what does Jesus say in Matthew 22, 37? He says, the law can be summed up this way. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. That's the greatest and most important important commandment. And then what comes with it? The second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. We've heard this before. This is a pretty simple truth. If I love Jesus, I will love people. And that when I love and help people, what should happen? The love that I have for Christ should overflow from me. I've learned these last couple of years, and I I hope my heart comes across for this. Um, Your walk with Jesus doesn't have to be boring. You know? I mean, Jesus told us in John 10.10 that he came that we would have life and have life abundantly. I never want to get in a rhythm where my Christian experience doesn't go beyond gathering for worship, giving a portion of my income, and reading my Bible each day. I mean, that's part of Christianity, but that's not all of it. We've been invited by the God of the universe to be on the front lines with the gospel message and the hope of the world and taking it to people to every crack, corner, and crevice 
all over the place. I don't want to miss that. I'm all for gathering for worship, Bible reading and giving and all of those things. But the Lord Jesus mobilizes his church. He never called us to be a cruise ship. We're to be a battleship, aren't we? Going out into culture with the hope of the gospel. Matthew chapter 25, I love this chapter. We're jumping all over the scriptures today. Jesus, again, think about this idea of loving people. He tells a parable or a story of the judgment of mankind where he's gonna separate at the end of time the sheep from the goats, as he calls them. Jesus followers from everybody else. And all of those that, that have put their faith in Jesus Christ are invited into eternity. And then look at what happens in Matthew 25, 35. Jesus tells this group of people that he's ushering into eternity. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me and I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Sounds an awful lot like the poor that's referenced in Psalm 41.1. And listen to their response to Jesus in verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, feed you, or thirsty, or give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in without clothing and clothe you? When did we see you sick in prison or visit you? I love the posture of these people that the Lord is telling us about. They said, Lord, when did we do that stuff? We were just considering the poor, just loving people like you had called us to do. Isn't that what we were supposed to do as followers of Christ? And what does Jesus say in verse 40 of Matthew 25? The king, I love that, the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, we could say, truly, whatever you did for the poor, for the orphan, for the widow, for the immigrant, whatever you did for them, you did for me. It's a reminder for us this morning, church, and I feel like this is God's message on my heart, and God reminds me of this all the time. When we serve the marginalized, we're serving Jesus. When we serve those in need, no matter what the need is, you are serving Jesus. I remember three years ago, our church hosted at my house in, uh, I lived in Worthington, Ohio at the time. We called it a resurrection dinner. I don't remember if I've shared this with you before. It was the day before Easter. We invited, um, it was about 50 Muslims over to our house for Easter dinner. You're, ne you're never gonna believe what the neighbors were thinking when that Saturday afternoon rolled around. Cars parking all over the place, people in all kinds of cultural dress, all kinds of stuff, walking through our neighborhood, cars everywhere, and they're all going to the pastor's house. What is that guy doing? We hosted all these people from all over the place, people from Algeria, Egypt, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, India, Majority were Muslims. We had several people that were Hindus, Sikhs, and Buddhists that all came together for an Easter dinner. Easter's about Jesus, by the way. But they all gathered for this meal. And my friend, he shared the gospel. We actually had, we printed out the resurrection story from Luke chapter 24 on a piece of paper. And in front of like 50 people plus volunteers, we had one of the Sikh priests in Columbus. Uh, Sikh is another other religious groups, the Sikh priest in Columbus read the resurrection story, which is the proclamation of the gospel, by the way, read the resurrection story to 50 Muslims that Saturday afternoon. That was wild. I'm not positive he knew what he was reading, but he did it anyways, right? It was amazing. And so my friend got up and he shared the gospel. He's a converted Muslim. I saw a gentleman in my backyard. His name was uh, Habib. Habib was in the backyard and I walked outside and he was standing out there with his little boy. And he asked me this question. He said, I, I, I need to know this. Why are you guys doing this? Why did you guys invite all of these people over for this dinner? I told him, I said, I, I said, a lot of the people here, they're Jesus followers. They're from our church, Living Hope. And we simply wanted to just show you people what it looks like to be loved well by Christians. We just wanted to love you guys this Easter season. And this is what he said to me. And hear this. He said, I've lived in America for 20 years. He was from, I believe, Iraq. I've lived in America for 20 years. He said, in 20 years, this is the first time I've ever been in the home of a Westerner and the first time I've ever been invited to the home of a Christian. God help us. If we love Jesus, we have to help people. We have to run to the marginalized 
to the poor, to the widow, to the orphan, to the immigrant, to the refugee. We've got to run to them with the hope of the gospel. Final point as we begin to close, don't forget God's blessing. Don't forget God's blessing. Take note of verses two and three of Psalm 41. David writes these words after he talks about being considerate of the poor. He said, the Lord will save him in the day of adversity. The Lord will keep him, preserve him. He'll be blessed in the land. You'll not give him over to his enemies and the Lord will sustain him in his sick bed. These are what I like to call the evident blessings of God. That there are times where you and I will serve the marginalized and God, by his grace, will extend an extra blessing to you and me. That doesn't mean that you're going to leave church today, hand a $5 bill out of the window to the guy that's holding up the sign at the intersection, and you're going to go home and there's going to be a $10,000 check in the mail. That's not what's going on here. There are times, though, where God extends a little bit extra measure of grace to his kids, that when we do what he says, that he blesses us in very unique, specific, immediate ways. But then there's also the delayed blessings of God. And these are the ones we fight for, church. Think back to Matthew chapter 25. Those people were helping others. No expectation of God's blessing on their life. They just helped out of the overflow of their love for Jesus. And what did Matthew 25, 34 say? Come, you who are blessed by my Father. What was the blessing that they were going to receive? Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You know why we serve, help, and love people? Because Jesus has given us eternity, and it's the least we can do. God will bless us occasionally with immediate blessings when we are obedient to his command to serve people. I talk about the story of our church and how our people are literally doing this week in and week out, and we've seen the immediate blessing of God recently. A church down in Canal Winchester, Ohio, called us up five weeks ago and says, we want to give you brand new padded chairs for your worship center. No cost to you. I'm a Baptist. I didn't have to say no, and I didn't have to pray about it. I said, okay, when can we come get them? For the last five years, we've met on hard plastic chairs. The first Sunday we had padded chairs in our worship center, you thought revival was going to break out at Living Hope. People were throwing a fit. About four weeks ago, we had a $40,000 donation of furniture to our ministry center from Lazy Boy. It was amazing. Recently, we ran out of books in our Finding Hope Center. We give away a book for all children to read every time a family comes through. Every child gets to leave with a book to help them learn English. We were out of books. But it was like three days later, a daycare showed up with 10 boxes of books for us. I said, here, we figured your ministry could use this. Then we got a call from the literacy committee in our community and said, hey, we heard you could use books. We're going to donate $1,000, purchase as many as you possibly can, as many as you want. Those are the immediate blessings of God when we help people. But then there's the delayed blessing. What makes my heart push forward is the hope of heaven. And not only the hope of heaven for me, but I think about the families like the gentleman who just a few weeks ago at our ministry center, when he was leaving, I asked him this question. I said, has anybody ever told you the story of Jesus? And he said, who? How can you live in this nation and not know who Jesus is? We shared the gospel with him and we're praying for him and we're continuing a relationship with him, hoping and praying that he comes to faith in Jesus so he can share in the kingdom of God with us. I think of the Ukrainian family that's been coming to our church the last month because their son asked if they could go to church. No church background, but they've been coming faithfully for the last four weeks. And we're praying and asking God, Lord, would you save them so that they could share in the hope of eternity like we have. Story after story I could share like that. Why do we do what we do? We don't do it for the immediate gratification and the blessing that we can get in this life. Why do we do it? Because eternity awaits the believer and I'm praying every day, God, I'm gonna take as many people with me as I can. I'm on a life mission to depopulate hell and overpopulate heaven, right? That's why we do what we do. What's the scripture say? Blessed are those who are considerate of the poor. It's the mission of the church because why? The gospel travels fastest on the back of helping people. As Pastor Matt comes to close our service this morning, let me ask you today, do you know Jesus personally? I think, and I end every service at Living Hope with that simple question, do you know Jesus? 
Not do you know about Jesus, not if your grandpa was a pastor, none of those things. Do you know Jesus? Have you actually repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ? And as Romans 10 talks about, have you made him Lord of your life? When Jesus takes over, he takes over. He doesn't get part of your life, he gets the whole thing. Have you ever made Jesus Lord of your life? If not, why not today? March 12th, 2023, sounds like a real good time to submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus and begin living for him.